Ah, it seems as if we're on Facebook Live. Um, welcome to the online Gurdjieff group. Uh, beautiful cat there. What's her name? Or his, his name? His name is, well, all our animals start out with one name and then it transmogrifies through yeah. to other yeah. names. So yeah. his common name right now is Squeaky. Because Squeaky. Uh, okay. But his real name is Ajax. Okay. So Squeaky is not a diminutive of Ajax, like, uh, no. you know, Tanya is of Tatiana or something. Uh, no, it's a completely, it's, it's a descriptor rather than. Oh, okay. Um, are your pets outdoor pets? Yeah, we have a wall garden. It's quite large, 660 square meters. So they Ooh, go out. That's a big garden. Yeah. Can they get over and, the wall? Um, no, no, it's two meters high at least more than okay. that. eight meters no three meters but Cats. no it's completely secret they can't get out wow that and 660 meters square meters that's that's big for uh, here it is not yeah. for a country but yeah for, for uh san miguel it's pretty big but we bought this lot back in 83 back before the city turned into the disaster it's become okay okay so how was the inner work going um any reflections on buffers any failures of trying to set yourself a will task uh trying to self-remember um any bumps on the uh road of life so to speak on the uh, road of inner work <laughs> um so i i noticed that um well first off speaking of bumps and failures um i i keep myself to see three cigarettes a day uh, and i've been really good at that uh for the past few months uh it's been pretty consistent and I was thinking about what you said about buffers and I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm pretty good at this. Um, and I, I didn't give it much more thought. And I noticed as soon as I linked the smoking, the, the three cigarettes with being an idea, all of a sudden there were all these voices that were like, no, you have to, you have to have another one today. You have to like, okay. they got louder. <laughs> um, and so there were, there were a couple of days where I had a fourth one yeah. uh, and just that's the way it is. Um, I did notice though that um, the the voice was it it was very slippery. So it would be like, oh, you you know you got up really early this morning. Uh, yeah. Normally I get up a little later, so it's the three kind of fit through the day, and it's like, oh, well, you've got a longer day today. And then I was like, well, no, I decided not to. And then it was like, well, you you know you're really tired. And then and then I was like, no, and it just kept coming up with. <laughs> new voices new, yeah. new, new reasons it wasn't like one specific thing yeah um and and, and yeah so it's you quite know, sly yeah yeah you're yeah, very yeah. sly and very persistent mm -hmm. um but uh three cigarettes a day uh ian i mean all i can say is wow uh there are so many smokers out there who would wish they could just smoke three cigarettes a day. Uh, were you ever a normal smoker, you know, 20, 25 cigarettes a day, a pack of cigarettes? I've never been able to do a pack. Um, uh, when I first started, well, for, for, for most of my smoking career, I, I would stick to about five or six. Oh, okay. Um, and I've just been trying to cut back lately. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's not that part's not been difficult for me um i don't know if i just more sensitive but usually if i if i have like if i set myself a level that i'm at um if i have more than that it's just i they're not enjoyable um, oh, okay. all scratchy. I, yeah it's just like it's i can't claim much willpower in that regard because it's very obvious that i'm i'm not enjoying it like it doesn't <laughs> no reason to, to do it unless I'm very stressed. Stress seems to be the, the, the instigator for that. Um, you, you mentioned something that I've actually observed, that buffers can start out 
pretty early in the morning. Um, it's almost like you wake up into them and, oh, come on, just, you know, you can have a big, big coffee today and it's okay. And um, so you've noticed that as well, that, you know, it's like you didn't get enough sleep and. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't, they, they, they don't seem to um, be very dependent on time. Um, you know, time of day. Um, and when I make, when I, when I, it seems to be that when I make a conscious effort to fight them, they get stronger. Yeah. Whereas if I, you know, if I'm like, oh, I kind of want another cigarette, but it's late. If I like plop myself down in front of the movie, or if it starts raining, or if I get into a conversation, you know, something else pulls my mm-hmm. Then, then, then they kind of go away. You know, the, the, I, if I'm not actively struggling against them, they seem to not be as active. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a very interesting observation that you made there. Um, I was when you were making it. I was thinking of it in terms of the state of identification or the Buddhist state of attachment and the state of non-identification or the state of non-attachment. That when you're really attached to something, the buffers get bigger and bigger. And when you can kind of step back inwardly and just let go of that identification, they calm down. Um, so there seems to be some kind of a connection with the state of identification or in the Buddhist sense, you know, being stuck in the state of attachment. Where when you really want the cigarettes and you're, or you want the drink or you want the coffee or whatever that they're bigger, but once you just kind of go, oh, they're not nearly as pervasive. It's almost like Mr. Gurdjieff, how he would yell at people until they stopped taking it personally. And the minute he saw them stop taking it personally, he stopped yelling. Um, so there must be some kind of uh, distinction there. Uh, for those of you who are joining us on YouTube or on Facebook, um, this is a continuation of last week when we were talking about buffers. And um, buffers to me are those little enabling voices, impulses. Um, I mean, they're the great enablers, they're the great justifiers they're the great come on you deserve it uh they're little like little voices and not just voices but they're also impulses almost like a feeling impulse that you know i deserve that copy i deserve whatever and these little voices that try to bring us down and block out uh the the light of conscience um, to really understand what I'm talking about, if you haven't watched uh, last week's meeting, go back. I think it's a fairly important one. I'm just going to uh, bring up a quote uh, from uh, William Peter Peters, who has provided us with questions before. Um, this was his response to last week's uh, meeting. One of my addictions is to coffee, and I've attempted to work with this before. The difficult part is when the body begins to crave the substance and the pain begins around the neck and shoulders. Is that a good time to sense the body by doing one of the sensing exercises? And again, there is no wrong time There's no bad time to sense the body. Um, Yeah, it's a wonderful time to sense the body. If you can bring your awareness into your body. I'm getting back to his uh, comment. The introduction of a sensing exercise seems to provide some direction at this critical point. I have tried this and noticed the very elaborate stories, eyes, story eyes begin to make up to justify a cup. Um, This is more like the buffer to justify. Anytime that there's the self-enabling, self-justifying, self-excusing, it's the buffer 
trying to lower our standards, trying to break us down. Um, I guess you know, buffers are created. It all begins to build into a huge friction until I reach a limit and break down by drinking a cup or things begin to explode in other ways. I get very negative, etc. As G said, the aim isn't to give up coffee, which I could probably do, but to see the buffers and the way the machine functions. Limits seem to be an important point with these efforts. So the act of putting ourselves in situations where uh, we confront our buffers is actually a very good thing. Um, now, buffers are at a lower level. Um, they, my, my guess is they have to be down at world 96. Uh, and, you know, it was Einstein, and not just Einstein, who said a problem can't be solved on the level of which it's created. And so for dealing with any kind of addictions, if you can step up beyond that level of the addictive uh, realm and generally just becoming mindful of stepping beyond that. So to become mindful when you realize that you have the impulse to drink a cup of coffee or to have that cigarette, that mindfulness as well is an inward detachment. It's pulling ourselves in from away from the state of attachment to a more of a state of detachment away from the state of identification into that state of disidentification into the state of self remembering where we're not identifying with the thing anymore um, this is something that i've talked about before in terms of the mindful dimensions of these teachings Every act of self-remembering it is an extreme form of mindful awareness. Now to become mindful of my hand, to sense my hand, to sense the fingers in my hands, the bones in my hands, I actually have to detach from my hand to observe my hand, to become aware of my hand. And all forms of mindful awareness involve this, however slight, inward detachment and when we're inwardly detaching in a sense we are also detaching from the realm of the buffers the buffers come from a state of attachment a state of identification they really want to keep us identified with that cup of coffee uh, with that cigarette with that drink with whatever and so just becoming aware of our body in that moment becoming aware of where we're holding the tension in our body. If it's our solar plexus, our chest, our throat, bringing relaxation into the process, we're stepping up to a higher state and we're stepping into a more inward state. And both of those will allow us to gain a better perspective, a better understanding of uh, buffers and the more... Um, negative dimensions of our existence. Now, I'm just going to uh, pull up something I should have pulled up before. Just give me a second. Um, now, I, I wanted to, to, in this week as well, to go back to some of the uh, recordings that I've made. Um, some of the small ones, uh, some that are fairly important. Fortunately, I'll be able to uh, play them. But, um, you know, uh, just a second. Uh, um, you know, uh, th this is a picture that I have on the YouTube videos right at the very start. I work for myself. I work for mankind. I work for the earth herself. To me, this is the recognition that we are not just doing this work for ourselves, for our own selfish, egotistical ends. Whenever we become aware of our body, whenever we become aware of our breath, we are actually working along three lines, for humanity and for the earth herself. Um, the vow that uh, uh, Roger Lipsy recorded in uh, his book, Gurdjieff Reconsidered, 
I believe it comes from, uh, I forget, uh, uh, Tracal. I could be wrong. One of Mr. Gurdjieff's students, French students, during the Second World War. So this is a translation into English from the original. I wish to be. I can be. I have the right to be. I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. So, you know, the importance of doing this work, um, the importance of the nature of this work. Um, now, I've got some old uh, recordings, videos that I made, um, I've made in the last year, a little over the last year. Um, and I'm gonna play some of these now. They're not that long. Um, the first one I'm gonna play is digesting active elements from the air we breathe. And this comes from the book, uh, G.I. Gurdjieff Early Talks, 1914 to 1931, even though this exercise is right at the end of the book and it's entitled 1939. Um, this is Mr. Gurdjieff's, someone recorded him saying this, they wrote it down. Uh, so this is his explanation of digesting active elements from the air we breathe. I made a few minor editorial changes to the words uh, to make them flow slightly better, but uh, this is Mr. Gurdjieff's. Um, and just give me a second to get this all set up. And this is just a six minute, uh, and in it, at the end, we're taught to do this. So this is Mr. Gurdjieff's virtually his own words. Um, and I'll take and play it now. So it's found on page 413, Gurdjieff's Early Talks, 1914 to 1931. And again, this is only meant to teach you how to perform this exercise. You should learn it and then do it on your own. Of ordinary life before doing this exercise by spending 15 minutes relaxing as deeply as you can. Now repeat the following out loud or in your mind. I am now about to begin this exercise which I have been fortunate enough to learn from Mr. Gurdjieff. and which will enable me, with the aid of conscious labor, to coat higher bodies in myself from active elements in the air I breathe. And bring your whole attention to this breathing exercise. Breathe normally and do not alter the natural rhythm of your breathing. Breathe in I and breathe out am with all three parts. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I and breathe out am with your cerebral hemispheres, cerebellum and spine and solar plexus. And when breathing out, imagine a part of the air stays in you and flows to the corresponding place where it flows, how it flows. That is its own business. You must only feel that a part remains in you. Now do not hold your breath. Just breathe in and out naturally. And when breathing out, Imagine something flows out like a gray fog. 
and take a corresponding posture that mobilizes an inner tension and causes your centers to work together for this aim. Doing this exercise properly with conscious labor and breathing this small property into your blood will make big results possible. Breathing normally without altering the natural rhythm of your breath. Now repeat the following out loud or in your mind. I am now about to begin this exercise. With full attention I will draw in my breath. Saying I and sensing the whole of myself. I wish very much to do this in order that I may digest air. Breathe in I and breathe out am with all three parts. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I and breathe out am with your cerebral hemispheres cerebellum and spine, and solar plexus. Breathe in I and breathe out am. And when breathing out, imagine part of the air stays in you and flows to the corresponding place, where it flows, how it flows. That is its own business. You must only feel that a part remains in you. Now repeat the following out loud or in your mind. I wish to keep this substance for myself. Breathe in I and breathe out am. And when breathing out, imagine something flows out like a gray fog. Breathing normally without altering the natural rhythm of your breath. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I and as you breathe out am, imagine a part stays in you and flows to the corresponding place. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I and as you breathe out am, imagine a gray fog flows out. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I and as you breathe out am, imagine a part stays in you and flows to the corresponding place. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I, and as you breathe out am, imagine a gray fog flows out. Breathe in I, and breathe out am, with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I, and as you breathe out am, imagine a part stays in you, and flows to the corresponding place. Breathe in I and breathe out am with mind, body and feelings. Breathe in I and as you breathe out am, imagine a gray fog flows out. Now this is one of the real, I believe, secrets to the inner work of George Gurdjieff. Uh, in, in Search of the Miraculous, Uspensky quotes him talking about the importance of air and how two people can breathe in the same air with all the same molecules, but one person breathes out a different type of air than the other person. And Mr. Gurdjieff talked about the fourth way being a very skillful way and that what they do 
in one month of being a fakir, one week, and these figures could be wrong, but they're right as well, metaphorically. One week of being a monk, one day of being a yogi, we can do in five minutes of proper breathing or 15 minutes of proper breathing. It's the awareness of all three centers, the head, the body, and the feelings, and breathing in with mind, body, and feelings, and breathing out that foggy waste. Through this conscious breathing, we're actually breathing in molecules that will allow the octave of air, that is the emotional self, to develop in our body. Uh, buffers are there to inhibit and block conscience, and conscience is so 12 of the octave of air. And so buffers are designed to negate conscience, they're designed to block conscience, to keep that octave of air at a very low level. Whereas this breathing exercise, breathing in, and uh, I've got one that's uh, called the morning sitting, which is based on George Eddy's version. It's a 22 minute uh, recording that I recommend people do in the morning. It's even a little bit more complex than this simple uh, one by Mr. Gurjeet. And as I said, most of this one uh, came from a talk Mr. Gurdjieff gave. It was very important that people understood this. And he hinted at it in many other places. Consciously breathing with all three centers allows us to breathe in the higher molecules, the higher particles that have to be present within us in order for the alchemical process to take place. Normally, the highest energy that the human body naturally produces is C12. And I've gone over the, the last number of meetings going back over C12 and the nature of C12 and the implications of this. But so 12 is conscience. It is the awakened hydrogen 12, world 12 substance. And somehow through this breathing exercise, and doing these breathing exercises, we seed the higher within us so that the lower has something to connect with. The higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle. And so doing these breathing exercises allows us to absorb higher, more refined substances from the air, substances that are not naturally produced in the human body, and substances which are necessary for our further inner evolution and growth. So I've had people come and say to me, and I've had people leave comments, this is just, you know, Buddhist breathing. Um, this is just Vipassana. And my response is, no, it's not. You have to understand the theory and the nature of the alchemical transformation this Vipassana is just conscious breathing. Vipassana is breathing and aware of your, the, the air coming in and going out, aware of your body breathing. But it's purely a self-sensing exercise for the body. It doesn't involve the head brain or the feeling brain. To bring the head brain and feeling brain into the process turns it into a three-brained exercise and really allows us to mine those higher elements that are within the air, bring them into ourselves so that with the octave of air, that there can be a certain uh, level of transformation that takes place or a certain transformational process, a higher process that takes place because we now have these substances within us. So it's a very important exercise, however we do it. Now I'm gonna play another um, exercise. Um, this one I, I've talked about many, many times, and I do it sort of towards the end of um, most of the inner work that I do. 
But I mean, this this version is again almost not quite, but almost in Mr. Gurdjieff's words. Um, so his explanation of what it is, his explanation of the importance of it, and um, the collected state, um, the atmospheric one that uh, Mr. Gurdjieff says that we should always, when we do some kind of a sitting, this is an exercise that we should finish the sitting with. So I'm just going to uh, call on the collected state exercise. Just give me a second. Um, and again, this is Mr. Gurdjieff's words, and I don't know. Where it went, um, this is telling me it's disappeared. Just a second. Um, whoops. Sorry about this, folks. Um, I think I had to stop sharing something before. And no, it's still not here. Um, let's just um, see if I can do it. Are you seeing this? I see it. And it says. Okay, no, that's not it. Um, I. It, let me do. Uh, I know probably why. Uh, you represent to yourself. Let me. Pardon? It was working there. Yeah. Yeah. It was <laughs> okay. Uh, for a second. Um, let me try and do that again. I don't know why sometimes this works. Why it sometimes it doesn't. Um, And nothing is coming up. Do you see it now? Uh, so, um, yes. The first exercise for self-remembering? You represent yes. to yourself that you are you can surrounded hear this? by an atmosphere. Okay, let me just uh, rewind it. Okay. The Collected State, an inner exercise by George Gurji. From transcripts of Gurdjieff's meetings, 1941 to 1946. Meeting 29, the first exercise for remembering oneself. You represent to yourself that you are surrounded by an atmosphere. Like the earth, you also have an atmosphere, which surrounds you on all sides for a meter more or less. In the atmosphere, the associations, the thoughts produce waves it concentrates at certain places. It recedes. It has movements according to the direction which you impart to it. This depends on the movement of your thought. Your atmosphere is displaced in the direction in which your thought goes. If you think of your mother, who is far away, your atmosphere moves towards the place where your mother is. When you do this exercise, you represent to yourself that this atmosphere has limits. For example, one meter and a half, shall we say? Then you concentrate all your attention on preventing your atmosphere from escaping beyond the limit. You do not allow it to go further than one meter or one meter and a half. When you feel your atmosphere quietened, without waves, without movement, then with all your will, you suck it into yourself. You conserve yourself in this atmosphere. You draw it consciously into yourself. The more you can, the better it is. To start with, 
It is very tiring. The first exercise for remembering oneself. Um, this is also one of the reasons, for instance, why um, as a Gurdjieffian, I have issues with many other teachers, uh, especially those who try to align themselves with the Gurdjieff teachings. And the biggest one that I'm thinking, he's now dead, his name was many names, the Bhagavan Sri Rajneesh. Uh, he created that uh, commune in Oregon. Uh, he became Osho. Uh, if you look at Osho, they start with screaming and pounding. And if you've ever gone to one of their meetups or meetings, I've gone to quite a few of them. Uh, they are the complete opposite of the collected state. Rather than trying to keep your atmosphere still, trying to keep it contained around you, it's almost as if they're doing everything they can to disperse their atmosphere, to prevent it from coalescing around them. And to understand this is to kind of think, well, there's something strange about what they're doing. Why would they be trying to disperse their atmosphere? What possible motivation could there be to getting so worked up that you can see videos of them writhing on the ground and screaming and pounding. Um, to me, there's an element of uh, brainwashing, social control, um, making people a bit docile. This whole idea of being calm, being contained, being centered is, in a sense, the opposite of that. And Mr. Gurdjieff said it is the first step in self-remembering. But he also talked about the collected state, that first we practice it when we're at home, after we've done a sitting, when we're very quiet. He also mentioned in the beginning of that uh, video, you know, where he said, uh, spend 15 minutes relaxing yourself, getting yourself into that deep, deep, deep state of calmness before you can practice the collected state exercise. But he also talks about the fact that as we grow in our strength and in our ability to remain in the collected state, that we could then go out into the world and practice the collected state exercise as we are walking down the street, as we are perhaps sitting on a subway or uh, going about our daily activity, that we can keep that awareness of our atmosphere, keep it around ourselves. And um, it's something that the more uh, uh, we develop with this exercise, the more we develop this ability that then, you know, it puts a greater responsibility on us to take it to more and more trying places. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff had a reputation for writing in some of the worst places like dive bars, so to speak, and lots of music. And he said that he went there to see humanity at its lowest in order to feel remorse of conscience to write. But I would also have guessed that it would have been a great exercise in maintaining the collected state, keeping yourself calm, keeping yourself tranquil wherever you are. Um, when you're physically agitated, when you're really upset about something, you're in a deep state of identification. And the collected state always involves that mindful awareness, that inward detachment. So to learn to go into the collected state in you know, harsh environments where lots of things are happening is actually a good inner exercise. To go somewhere where people are yelling and you know, there's lots of noise and whatever, 
and to try to keep your thoughts, your sensations, and your feelings calm, to try to become aware of your atmosphere about a meter around you, to pull it in to yourself, to become aware of its boundary, um, is also a good practice, uh, a, a good way to help us develop ourselves. Um, I'm going to try to share a, another video. Um, I don't know what I'm doing right and wrong with them. Um, this one comes from uh, endlesssearch.co.uk, and it was set up by um, uh, a, a student of Paul Beidler, or Beidler, and Paul Beidler, Beidler was a student of Mr. Gurdjieff. He met Mr. Gurdjieff at uh, the Priere in 1923 um, and, you know, was a lifelong student of Mr. Gurdjieff. Uh, he also, as a teenager, spent two years with the Yazidis um, before he met Mr. Gurdjieff and a very interesting person, Paul Biedler. Uh, one of the people in my Tuesday evening group actually worked with him for 15 years. They would get into a van in Toronto every six weeks drive down to uh, a forest in Pennsylvania, spend the weekend with uh, Paul Beidler, and then drive back up and then, then spend the next six weeks digesting the exercises he taught them, going through some of the notes he gave them. And then they would go back down for, you know, every, uh, for another weekend. And they did this for about 15 years. And um, this exercise is an exercise that uh, Beidler recommends that we do in the morning before we've even gotten out of bed. And it's called the 60 bone exercise. And it's done with the hands. It's also done with the holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being prayer. So we go for the thumb, and it's the, you know, there are three bones, including the bone deep in the finger, deep in the palm. And so for our thumb, we focus on the three bones, and we think holy affirming. And then we move over to our index finger and the three bones, holy denying. And then we move to the middle, holy reconciling. And then the fourth finger, transubstantiate in me. And then the fifth one, for my being. There are 15 of these bones, three finger bones, times five fingers. So for each hand or foot, there's 15 bones. Together, there are 60 bones. So it's called the 60 bone exercise. And I go through it uh, in this recording three times. And I've got the images, and I'm doing this this week to show you. I've got the uh, you know, the link will be posted with the video where these inner exercises are. Um, they are online. Um, whoops. And um, let me see if this. Uh, oh, can you see the screen? Yep. Oh, yeah. Holy denying. Uh, Holy. That was working, Alan. It was. Is it stopped working? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. I don't know what I did. Uh, okay. Are you seeing it now again, Ian? Uh, no, it's not come back. Okay. I don't know. Why this transubstantiate? Is it back? Me? Uh, yes, yes, working. Okay, I'm just going to go right to the the the, the beginning again. Holy affirming. Great. Holy denying. Holy reconciling. Transubstantiate in me. For my being. This is the 60 bone exercise. Become aware of all three bones in each finger and toe and repeat a line from the holy affirming prayer in the following sequence. 
wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me, for my being, Wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying. Wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me. for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me, for my being, Wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, Wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me. for my being, and I should uh, mention that 
our hands and our fingers, our feet and toes are also considered special apparatuses. Um, there's an exercise that, uh, it's a fairly advanced exercise for connecting with sacred impulses. Uh, and it's done through the hands and fingers, the feet and the toes. Through our hands and fingers, feet and toes, we're able to draw in energy uh, from other parts of the universe. It's a way that we can connect with uh, other energies. So these are not just, oh yeah, let's do an exercise on the hands and the fingers, the feet and toes, that there is something deeper going on here. Developing this awareness of our hands, our fingers, our feet and toes, also our limbs. Um, because it's through the limbs, but through the fingers in the hands, in the limbs, that we pull in the energy. And so it's very important to recognize you start with the right, then you, at least for the finger exercises, you go down to the left, then you go to the right, and you go back up to the left. Other exercises, like the four limb exercise, you start with the right, then uh, the right arm, the right leg, the left leg, and the left arm. Um, so the, these are not just made-up exercises to become aware of fingers and toes and limbs and things like that. There are ultimately uh, deeper and greater um, significance to these exercises. Now I'm going to go back to a, uh, um, another exercise that I want to do. Um, this is the 12 joint exercise, uh, uh, sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us. Um, this prayer along with holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being are all found on the same page. I think it's something like page 768 but I could be off by a few pages in Beelzebub Tales. Um, he links them all. Uh, this is another important one. This is one for moving. Um, to do this as a moving exercise. So when you're gardening, when you're walking down the street, it can also be done sitting, but it is ultimately designed to be a moving exercise. Um, so it's the sources of divine. Um, it's a wonderful prayer uh, that's found in, I believe it's page 768, uh, the Holy Planet Purgatory chapter in uh, uh, Beelzebub Tales. Um, let me just see if I can get this. Um, whoops. Uh, See if I can. Sh oh. Can can you see sources of mm -hmm. divine rejoicings, revolts, and okay. sufferings? Direct your actions upon us. This is a walking exercise, though it can be done when sitting. Second, I think I think I screwed it up. Uh, um, this is a short one. Uh, let me just try it again. Um, do you see the image of the bone sources? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings. Direct your actions upon us. This is a walking exercise, though it can be done when sitting. Bring your attention to each joint and silently repeat the word. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us. 
sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings. Direct your actions upon us, sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings. Direct your actions upon us. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm going to just go back. Um, this one is a moving exercise. And uh, it uses the prayer, sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings, direct your actions upon us. Each one of these words lines up with a specific joint. So sources is our right wrist, of is our right elbow, divine is our right shoulder, rejoicings is our left hip, revolts is our left knee, and is our left ankle, sufferings is our right ankle, direct is our right knee, your is our right hip, actions is our left elbow, upon is our or our left shoulder upon is our left elbow and us is our left wrist and this is something we are supposed to do as we're out walking working in the garden doing whatever and i'm just going to replay it it's a very short one just a minute and 10 seconds sources of divine rejoicings revolts and sufferings direct your actions upon us this is a walking exercise, though it can be done when sitting. Bring your attention to each joint and silently repeat the word. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us. So, um, hello, uh, Angelica. Um, you joined us. Um, how are things in Sao Paulo, Brazil? Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. Hi. You're good? Oh, not so much. I was uh, trying to help some animals here. Oh, okay. And, but, okay. Okay. Well, you live near a forest, I guess. Um, so I'm going to try and play one more um, final one, and this uses a different prayer. You can find this prayer in uh, in Search of the Miraculous. Um, I believe it's also on that page in uh, Beelzebub Tales, and uh, this is an ancient prayer. Uh, I believe it's more associated with the Eastern tradition. Um, so it's. Uh, Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Um, so the have mercy on us is very important in the Gurdjieff teachings. Um, it's one of the more important prayers to, to do on a regular basis. Have mercy on us or have mercy on me or just Lord have mercy. Um, but this one, holy God, holy firm. Holy immortal, have mercy on us. And let me just see if, uh, whoops, I've got to. Can you see this? Holy firm, holy. Can we see this? I. I... Yes, you can. We can see and hear it. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Holy God, holy firm. And just I want to point out um, again. Let me just uh, maybe I'll bring it. Yeah, th this is a uh, a bone exercise um, where we bring illumination into the center of the marrow of certain bones and become aware of them while saying this prayer: Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Say the words, sense your bones, and visualize your marrow illuminating. Practice this exercise when walking, sitting, or lying down. Holy God, holy, firm, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, firm, Holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Holy, God, holy, firm, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. So uh, again, uh, very short. Um, let me stop sharing. A short exercise. Uh, holy, our right lower leg, God, our right upper leg, holy, our pelvic bones, firm, our right or left upper leg, holy, our left lower leg, and then all the way up our spine, including uh, our skull, uh, immortal, and then have our right arm, mercy, our right lower arm, our right upper arm on us. And these are different exercises that we can do. Um, so I wanted to share them today. They are also, they are on uh, the Gurdjieff uh, uh, Group of Toronto YouTube website. Um, they're on a playlist of exercises in the Gurdjieff tradition. Just uh, Rather than walking down the street, blah, 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 da, 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 the mind just going off on its own. If you walk down the street and as you're moving, you bring your attention to your right wrist and you say sources and then your right elbow, all your right shoulder, divine, your left hip, uh, rejoicings, your left knee revolts, your left ankle and your right ankle suffering, your right knee have, your right hip mercy, your right shoulder on or have, I bet it all mixed up, um, rejoicings, sources of divine rejoicings, revolts and sufferings have mercy. I've got it somewhere mixed up. Um, have mercy on us. Have, oh yeah, have mercy on us. So the have is in the right hip. Um, so as you're walking down the street, memorize that one. Uh, when you're doing gardening, when you're going outside, if you want to stop the chatter of the head brain, and just allow uh, yourself to begin doing two-brained work. So you're keeping your head brain occupied with these words, with the rhythm of the words, with the placement of the words, and your body brain is being occupied by the movement. And so what we are doing with these simple prayers, and that's also an important dimension of them, they are prayers. Um, we can turn very mundane tasks into deep inner work. Um, I'm not sure if I can, I probably can't find it right now. Let me just see if I can. Um, where I did a correspondence between a lot of the, ah, here it is. 
um, these prayers. So let me pull this up. Uh, so sources of divine rejoicings. Rejoicings is the affirming. It's the positive. It's the active element. Revolts. Revolts is the negative, the denying, the opposing element. And sufferings. Sufferings is the reconciling element that reconciles the rejoicings and the revolts. And then sources of divine. You know, uh, if you read In Search of the Miraculous, you could be led to believe that God and the divine and none of that plays a real big role in the Gurdjieff teachings. But the intellectual fervor of someone like P.D. Uspensky and the milieu in which he sort of came about to, you know, to become an adult, there was a lot of skepticism. Um, there was a lot of turning away from religion. Um, there was a lot of, you know, moving more towards deism and um, pantheism and different ways of understanding things. And it was considered very old fashioned um, to still be a Christian or to still be a believer. And so you don't find a lot of the word like God in In Search of the Miraculous. Um, but some of these prayers are listed there and this also these three are actually found on the same page of the elves of tales and i this is again off the top of my head i think it's like 768 they're all placed on the same page nothing was done accidentally in that book there are these deep correspondences between them um, I've just highlighted a few here with the positive, negative, and equalizing. So when we add these prayers to the movements, to going for a walk, to becoming aware of, I mean, the sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions on us. This is the 12 joint exercise. So there's a divine component, a higher component. There's a component for the intellectual center, the head brain. It's also a body brain exercise. So bringing the various sensing points, you know, to the right wrist, right elbow, right shoulder in this particular exercise. The other two exercises, uh, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me. For my being. In In Search of the Miraculous, one of the few prayers that are listed there is Holy God, Holy Firm, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. Mr. Gurdjieff said that this was an ancient prayer, um, particularly uh, within the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And he said it was a prayer to the Trinity, um, the three forces. So, Holy God being the positive, Holy Firm being the negative or the holy denying, and holy immortal being the holy reconciling. And again, the have mercy on us. Now, the interesting thing about the holy God and the holy affirming exercises in English is that they contain 10 words each. So my lower right leg bone, or bones, the bones in my right upper leg, my pelvic bones, the bones in my upper left leg, the bones in my lower left leg, the bones up my spine and skull. When we do that, there are actually 10 points. And so we can substitute either one of these prayers. We did the 60-point hand exercise. Uh, we use the holy affirming, holy denying. We could also use the holy God, holy firm, holy immortal prayer. Um, 
These are, the bottom two are interchangeable. But just to recognize that when we do these things, when we walk down the street and we move from joint to joint to joint as we're moving, as we're saying these prayers, not only is there the intent of the prayer behind what we are doing, but it's also a moving exercise for the moving center. And the need to move our awareness from our right uh, wrist to our right elbow to our, our right shoulder um, is almost, excuse me, in a sense, like a counting exercise because there's a proper form and sequence. We've got to pay attention to all of these different levels. So the incorporation of prayers through inner exercises is also strongly uh, recommended in these teachings. These are not atheist teachings. They're not pantheistic teachings. Um, you know, uh, we can debate what they are in terms of Mr. Gurdjieff's approach to the divine. But these are very, very specific prayers, very specific ways of connecting with who and what we are. The positive symbol is our head brain. The negative symbol is our body brain. The equalizing symbol is our feeling brain. Head brain, body brain, feeling brain. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, or rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings. There's a commonality between these. These all have a similar meaning if you can delve a little bit deeper. So doing these prayers, doing these inner exercises are very, very, in a sense, simple tasks, but they're incredibly complex. If you walk around and you go sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings, uh, it will take you a few days, and not doing it all the time, but uh, doing it today, practicing, doing it tomorrow, practicing, doing it the next day, perhaps for 20 minutes, and you will get the exercise down. It's not a complex exercise, but to continue to do it, to set it up as a will task. You know, every time I walk to the store, I am going to do the sources exercise, uh, can add an element of practice and inner work to your daily activity. Um, so... Prayers are important, and prayers don't necessarily have to be done in, you know, a very sacred space on your knees. They can be done walking down the street, sitting in a chair, done in conjunction with an awareness of our bones, done in a conjunction with an awareness of our hands and our feet. Uh, we can turn whatever we do into an inner exercise, just bringing ourselves back to our body, bringing ourselves back to this moment is a very important exercise. Collecting ourselves, entering into a collected state is a very important exercise. And we can do this wherever we are, whatever we're doing. Um, a lot of traditions, it seems to be that you go off to your little prayer chamber, to your altar, to wherever, and you conduct your morning ritual, and then you go out on your day. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff said, always and everywhere. Remember yourself always and everywhere. Ultimately, we want to bring this into the world. Uh, one of the big differences between this and a lot of spiritual traditions um, particularly coming from the East, where they involve the fleeing of the world, uh, going towards sacred spaces, towards a monastery, 
or some kind of monastic environment towards isolating ourselves from the world so that we can work on ourselves because it's much more difficult to do this in the world. This teaching, it says that, no, you've got to go do it in the world. And so this gives us an opportunity. It gives us an awareness of how we can bring uh, these exercises into life, into our regular uh, existence. Now, um, there's 10 minutes to go. I'm going to hopefully push it back on you guys. I know, um, for instance, Ian, you've done a, a bit of work around these particular exercises, especially waking up in the morning um, with your, you know, doing these 60 point uh, hand exercises and stuff. Do you have any comments on them? I, I do, I do. Um, I, I haven't done the, the, the 60 bones in the morning for a while, um, but it was uh, maybe about a year ago, I was doing it pretty regularly. I would wake up and try and run through all 60 bones with the prayer three times without losing track and getting distracted and falling asleep, which was difficult <laughs> uh, since I just I woken up. Um, I'd often have to, and any time I noticed that I'd gotten distracted or forgotten where I was in the prayer, I'd start over with three rounds. Um, and that was quite a struggle uh, to keep on uh, with in the morning. Uh, what I noticed today was that there's an element of the prayer for me that is, that I didn't notice this before, but it, it became very strong today that the prayer is a, seems to be a feeling center. Um, it, it involves the feeling center. Yeah, I, I, I was going to mention it, then I wasn't going to mention it, then I was going to mention it, and then you mentioned it, so that's good. Uh, uh, I, I, I noticed it. There's a there's a, a way I can sort of call out yeah. uh, with the feelings uh, through the prayer. And um, I was able, I mean, with, with your recordings, you know, playing in the background, it's always easier because mm -hmm. if, I, if I lose track for a second, the recording's there to kind of pull me back. Yeah. Um, but in this moment, I found involving the feelings by by the end of the three rounds, I something in me felt tired. Mm. Uh, it was it was definitely work. Um, my it was very hard to maintain my attention on what I was doing, um, and not in the past it was hard because I would get distracted. Um, so it was it was difficult to stay on task, but it wasn't tiring. Um, and, and today I noticed, you know, sort of similar to, you know, you hold tension yeah. and then you got it, something like that. Well, why do you think that is? Do you think it is because that you added the emotional dimension to it today and became that aware was, of that? And it may have taken you just that step beyond where you'd been practicing it before? That would be yeah. my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because the other ones uh, didn't have the same effect. The the, the I think the, the recordings were a little quicker. Yeah. Um, and so I had a harder time engaging the feelings um, with the prayer and the sensing and, and the, the words at the same time. Um, well, I mean, this points, it brings a, a, another point that's very important. Um, the fact that you practiced the 60 point, you know, hands and feet exercise probably helps to account for the fact that you were now able to take this particular one to the next level and to become aware of that feeling. Whereas the other ones, you probably didn't practice them nearly as much as you have done this one. And so at a certain point, we practice it and you know it's like juggling. You start with one ball and then two and then three and you add more and more to make it more and more complex. And with this one, you've got that practice, you've got that work on it so that for it to become more and more complex. And that also brings me to uh, a, another aside. I didn't create these recordings to have people listen to them over and over and over again. They do keep us on track, but especially the ones like the 60 bone, uh, the 10 joint, the illumination and the various ones, I created these more as training wheels. So you're not supposed to listen to them when you do them. You're supposed to listen to them to figure out how to do them 
and then to go and practice on your own wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I recorded them to maintain a degree of authenticity in the transmission of these recordings, but uh, just to learn them. They're like training wheels. Um, any other comments? No? Okay, I'm going to uh, bring this meeting to a close just a touch early. And uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. I actually have to go to the toilet really bad. So I figure I might as well just bring it to a close now, admit to my bodily functions. Um, but yeah, getting back more to the inner exercises, think about them, practice them. Um, there will be a description underneath the YouTube video, a link to the exercises. There's actually a link on the uh, Facebook Right now, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, there is a link there to the YouTube channel with the inner exercises. Go through them, practice them, learn them. At any rate, I'd like to thank you all for being here and uh, take care. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye now.